Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Richard Ryan, and I am Senior Washington Correspondent for the Detroit News and President of the National Press Club. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, and those of you who are watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio. The video archive of today's luncheon is provided by Connect Live and is available through the National Press Club website at press.org. National Press Club luncheons are also carried live by many sites on the World Wide Web. Press Club members may also access transcripts of our luncheons at our website. Non-members may purchase transcripts, audio and videotapes by calling 1-888-343-1940. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of, of some upcoming speakers. On Monday, May 21st, Stephanie Powers, actress and president of the William Holden Wildlife Foundation, will discuss efforts to conserve endangered wildlife species that are now threatened by illegal commercial hunting. And on Wednesday, May 23rd, Joseph Leonard, chairman and president and CEO of AirTran Airways, will be our guest. His topic, Fasten Your Seatbelts, a view of the airline business from a low carrier, low fare carrier perspective. And on Thursday, May 24th, George D. Warrington, President and CEO of Amtrak, will be here to discuss his proposals to solve the national transportation crisis. If you have any questions for our speaker, and I trust that you will, please write them at, on the cards that are provided at your table and pass them up to me but please make sure to write legibly because I can't ask them if I can't read them. Uh, I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. Please hold your applause until all head table guests are introduced. From your right and my left, Tony Pugh, national correspondent for Knight Ritter. Adriel Bettelheim, reporter, Congressional Quarterly. Amy Fickling, managing editor, Telecom Reports. Gary Martin, Washington Bureau Chief, San Antonio Express News. Kim Wallace, Senior Vice President, Lehman Brothers. Gil Klein, Media General News, News Service and a former president of the National Press Club. And skipping over our speaker for a moment, Bill Roberts, Bloomberg News mm -hmm. and the Press Club member who organized today's luncheon. Thank you, Bill. Manuel Mirabel, Chair, the National Hispanic Leadership Coalition. Carol Bowers, Associate Editor, Kiplinger, Washington Editors. Takeshi Yamawaki, U.S. E Economics Correspondent, the Shahi Shimbun. <laughs> Our guest today, Ed Whitaker, is somewhat of an anomaly in today's business world. He has been with the same company for 38 years. He started as a lineman for Southwestern Bell back during his college days in Texas. Today is chairman and chief operating officer, chief executive officer of Southwestern's successor company, SBC Communications, Inc. Under Mr. Whitaker's guidance, SBC grew from the smallest of the seven baby bells created by the breakup of AT&T in 1984 to become the second largest local telephone company in the United States. Last year, SBC's revenues exceeded $51 billion. The company has grown mostly by acquisition. Mr. Whitaker has purchased Pacific Telesis, Southern New England Telephone, and most recently, Ameritech. Today, SBC provides telephone services to one-third of the nation. It is the dominant provider in 13 states, including California, Texas, Illinois, and Michigan. It is also part owner of Singular, the nation's second largest wireless telephone company. It also has become the second largest internet access provider in the nation. Mr. Whitaker has made no secret of his intention to build SBC into one of the top four global telecommunications firms. Though the stock market retreat has cooled the pace of growth for now, Mr. Whitaker is known both for his coolness and boldness in doing deals. On the verge of closing a mega merger in 1998, he calmly chaperoned his daughter at her wedding, giving no hint that on the following day he would bet the company on the $62 billion acquisition of Ameritech. 
when SBC bought Pacific Telesis, Mr. Whitaker promised the Communications Workers of America there would be no layoffs following the acquisition. He held true to his word, and he became the first executive in 40 years to be invited to the union's annual convention. Mr. Whitaker was born 59 years ago in Ennis, Texas, a town of about 12,000 located south of Dallas. And he appears to have maintained his small town tastes and values. He has told friends that he prefers a bologna sandwich to fancy French food. He continues to maintain a 1,200-acre ranch about 80 miles north of San Antonio, where he clears his own brush and builds ponds. Mr. Whitaker earned his bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from Texas Tech University in 1964. He worked his way through a variety of posts at Southwestern Bell and SBC, becoming the chief executive in 1990. Under his leadership, SBC has been named the most admired telecommunications company in America by Fortune Magazine for four successive years. SBC also is regularly cited for the diversification of its workforce. The company has been named as one of the 10 best places for minorities to work and America's top company for women and minority business owners to do business with. Mr. Whitaker has an easygoing management style, but don't be fooled by that, his friends say. He looks like he just got off his horse, a John Wayne type who's easygoing and slow talking, said one friend, but you wouldn't want to get into a fight with him. <laughs> now he's in a fight, a battle over the future of the broadband market. And he's here today to tell us about that fight. So please welcome to the National Press Club, a man who has been described as John Wayne in a business suit, Ed Whitaker, Chairman of SBC Communications. Thank you very much, Dick. I've been called a lot of things this morning. I've never been called. <laughs> Anomaly. John Wayne in a business suit. I'm none of that, but anyway, it was a very nice introduction. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today at this prestigious forum and to be able to talk to you about my business. The National Press Club has hosted some of the most influential speakers of our time, and I thank you for inviting me. Bill informed me that this is a good crowd, but Miss America was bigger. So I know my position. It's especially good to be here now that Washington has a uh, renewed appreciation for Texans. <laughs> you know, I used to get kidded a lot about my Texas accent when I would come to Washington. But I've seen more boots and heard more howdies on this visit than I did all month in San Antonio, <laughs> just for your information. As I begin today, I would like to offer my best wishes to President Bush as he tackles the tough issues facing America. I believe he will do very well, but in all honesty, I think he stumbled on a major issue early on. I'm not talking about the easy issues like tax cuts or global warmings. I'm talking about the policy of surrendering your wireless phone at the White House, <laughs> as I see you do here. It's an outrage. The right of every American to talk on a wireless phone has to be somewhere in the First Amendment, I think. <laughs> it's certainly a belief that I hold dearly. So if your phone rings and you forgot to turn it off during my talk, go right ahead and answer it. It won't bother me a bit. In fact, we'll probably stop and let you complete your conversation. <laughs> Of course, President Bush is not the first Texan to stir things up in Washington, is he? Other Texans have played big roles here in years past. It's not only a great source of pride, I guess, for Texas, but it's also the source of some great stories. There's one involving Lyndon Johnson that's particularly interesting, I think, and very appropriate to my topic today. When LBJ served in the U.S. Senate, he had a reputation for always trying to one-up his colleagues. For instance, he got one of the very first car phones that was produced. They were awfully rare back in those days, and he used it to tease his colleagues as much as anything else. For example, every night when Johnson left for home, he'd call Senator Dirksen 
from his car and he'd say, hello Ev, I was just riding along here in my car and I thought I'd give you a call. After a while, Senator Dirksen got tired of this and he finally got his own car phone. One evening, as soon as he saw Johnson leave, Senator Dirksen ran down to his car and called LBJ. He said, hello Lyndon, I just saw you drive out and I thought I'd give you a call on my car phone. There was silence for a few seconds, then LBJ said, be with you in just a minute, Ev, my other line's ringing. <laughs> True story, I think. <laughs> Who knows if that story is really true? But when you've got a good story to tell, sometimes you just can't let the facts get in the way. I know that's sacrilegious to say to the press and at the press club, so excuse me. But when you think about it, refusing to let facts interfere with a good story sounds a little bit like the telecommunications policy debates to me. Those of you who follow the issues have heard some pretty good ones. I enjoy entertaining stories as much as anyone, but there are limits to how many facts a person can ignore. For example, in our case, it's very hard to watch more than 400 competitors, 400 competitors come into our territory, serve more than 10 million access lines, and still have my company called a monopoly. That's difficult to do. It's very difficult to track and report on more than three million wholesale performance measures every month reported to the government and still be criticized for not doing enough. And it's frustrating to hear America's largest cable company, which operates a monopoly network, demand additional regulations on the phone companies like mine. I'm not gonna rehash the entire telecommunications debate on telephone competition today. That's not my objective. I would rather talk about the future, not about what some companies have neglected to do for the last five years. I want to talk today about the opportunity before Congress to remove the single greatest threat to competition facing the American telephone consumer, the cable stranglehold that is developing in the broadband marketplace the cable stranglehold that is developing in the broadband marketplace. We should start with one basic fact today. The local telephone market is wide open and competition is flourishing. According to the U.S. Telecom Association, competitors are serving in this country 20 million access lines. Frankly, I think that underestimates the inroads that competitors have made. I just mentioned a few numbers specific to SBC, and though it, it pains me to say it, here's another statistic. Competitors have grabbed 40% of the market share for business customers in our big cities. 40% of our business customers in our big cities. That's 40% of the business market just gone, It's just gone. On the other hand, the percentages are not the same for the residential side. Competition for residential cons consumers or customers is not as robust as it is for business customers. That much is certainly true. But the whole truth about local service competition is this. If you're a residential phone customer, competitors like AT&T, for the most part, simply don't want your business. They simply don't want your business. On the other hand, if you're a mid-sized business owner or an IT manager for a very large company, competitors are tripping over themselves to win your account. They certainly want your business. There's a simple reason why this is. That's where the money is. The money is in the business side, the, the businesses. For a century, and I'm sure you've heard this, the regulators, people who regulate our business, have set business rates higher than the actual cost of providing them, and substantially higher than residential rates. This was, keep, this was to keep, and it was intentional, to keep residential rates below cost and universally affordable, and we've done a terrific job at that. Almost everybody has a phone, and it is very affordable. 
so if you and the audience today are the strategic planner for a telecom competitor and if you value your job you will not spend much time trying to capture residential customers in Hondo, Texas at $10 a month. They pay about $10 a month for basic service. It costs about $30 a month to provide that service. You're going to draw a bead, I guess that's a Texas phrase, you're going to draw a bead on business customers in Houston, Dallas, and other large cities. And certainly you would do that. That's exactly what our competitors are doing. They are successfully taking our business customers, using our networks, using our operating systems, and using our pricing. All the things they see, all the things they say impede their ability to serve residential customers somehow work just fine to serve business customers. I find it rather strange, the same network that they say impedes them from serving residential customers, the very same components seem to work just fine when they serve business customers. And it's happening everywhere. Companies are competing where they can make the most money. I don't blame them for making their choice, but they shouldn't blame us, SBC, and other companies for the business decisions they make. There is hope for residential customers, though. In fact, one of the best kept secrets in telecommunications is that six states in this country are competition hotbeds. Texas, Kansas, and Oklahoma, for example, residential competition is robust. Since January of 2000, competition in Texas has exploded by any measure you'd like to use. Access lines captured by competitors nearly double to three million. The number of competitor orders we process each month have more than tripled to 584,000. The long distance company's reaction is just as startling. In Kansas and Oklahoma, for example, AT&T has started giving away 30 long distance minutes to customers. Why? Why has this happened? Because those states, along with Connecticut, New York, and Massachusetts, are the only states where the incumbent like me, like SBC, is allowed in the long distance business. The result is more competition, more choices, and lower price, just as the Telecom Act intended. The message being, when you allow everybody to compete in all markets, you get competition across the board, residential and business. So the question is, why isn't there more competition? Because it's there. The real question is, why can't consumers in 44 other states have the same benefits that the people in Texas and New York now enjoy? The lesson then is clear. When companies are allowed to compete on an equal footing, competition works for the consumers. And now Congress has the very same opportunity to bring those same benefits to the broadband market by passing the Internet Freedom and Broadband Deployment Act. Broadband, also known as high-speed access to the Internet and the amazing services that it will, it will enable for you and I, is the name of the game today. Broadband is the name of the game. Companies are offering different technologies. DSL service which SBC provides. Cable modems, which cable TV companies provide. Satellite and fixed wireless are all fighting to meet what is a robust consumer demand. The competitors are investing their own money into their own networks, meaning there is no bottleneck, no bottleneck for the consumer. But one competitor one competitor, one kind of technology has the lion's share of the market in broadband. It operates a closed monopoly network. It faces no obligation to make pieces of its network available to others. It does not have to resell its services. It does not have to make its operating systems conform to the systems used by a dozen other companies. Does that sound a lot like the telephone market of just a few years ago? 
It does, doesn't it? Sounds a lot like it. Only this time, it's the cable companies. It's the cable television companies which dominate broadband, serving 75% of the market today. But they are unregulated. Meanwhile, the phone size book regulations created for voice communications are imposed only on the telephone companies like SBC. Despite that, the broadband market is nothing like the old voice telephone market used to be. And the results are predictable, I think. In 1999, SBC announced the biggest broadband network built out in the nation. We committed to invest $6 billion to bring high-speed DSL to 80% of our customers, which is 72 million Americans. At first, we were required to create a brand new standalone data subsidiary to provide DSL service. We had to hire, we had to train, and we had to transfer employees, create new databases, transfer the network, and transfer customers to the new company. I think you can imagine that the millions of dollars it cost to do that to create a new subsidiary. But you can't imagine the damage that that rule cost by complicating our ability to meet customer expectations. The cable companies can't imagine it either because they don't face a similar requirement. No separate subsidiary required. Still, in, in spite of that, we plowed ahead with our new network, a key element of which has been and will be 17,000 neighborhood broad band gateways that we are installing. These units house DSL units that make broadband possible. We're putting them in all neighborhoods across our geography, our territory, rich and poor, urban, suburban, some cases rural, without cherry picking communities or neighborhoods. It's the most democratic with a small d deployment of broadband in America. Before we could turn these gateways on, and we wanted to turn them on, we asked the FCC for a ruling on a simple question. Who should own the equipment in these gateways? Could our telephone company own it? Or did we have to put it in our new advanced services subsidiary? The answer would determine how competitors used our equipment. It took nine months to resolve thanks mostly to our competitors who turned it into a contested regulatory proceeding. In that time, the unregulated cable companies raced ahead with their deployment, and we lost a lot of ground to them in broadband. Millions of consumers were forced to continue waiting for DSL. Additionally, the FCC required SBC and Verizon and some others to make our broadband gateways bigger to accommodate competitors. This cost us $50 million, and so far only one company has requested space. Now the states are asserting themselves because there are regulators in the states too. Illinois regulators have issued rules that effectively overturn the FCC on the ownership issue. Their decision is going to add, or would add, at least $500 million to our cost. As a result, I think we did what you did. We've been forced to stop building the new network in Illinois until this issue is resolved, which means a lot of consumers in Illinois are not going to have DSL as a broadband choice or option. We're going to continue to provide it with our existing network, those close to our central offices, but we cannot invest our share owners' money into a new network and then have to turn our DSL network over to our competitors. Illinois regulators, fortunately, are reconsidering this, so hopefully we can work our way through it. All this points up, and the only purpose is to say, what's wrong with the broadband regulation? The rules are set today so that telephone companies assume all the risk for investing in new technologies, while competitors can assume the reward at little cost to themselves. It's a major disincentive to compete, to innovate, and to invest. Caught up in all of this, then, are the consumers who expect and deserve the very best that my industry can produce. 
When we face regulations that raise our cost for deploying and operating a service, as we do for DSL, we have two very hard choices to make. We can stop deploying the service, as we have in Illinois, or we can raise the price of the service, as we recently did in other locations. That's a difficult decision for a businessman to make. I would love to continue offering our DSL service for the same price that cable companies offer cable modem service, but the simple truth is that regulations have added cost to our service that cable operators do not have to absorb. You can guess what happened next when we raised prices just weeks later, AT&T followed by hiking its monthly cable modem service by $6. Very predictable. And now other cable companies are expected to follow suit and raise their rates for broadband service as well. The cable companies today have the best of both worlds. Our price increase has given them the cover to raise their rates and still be priced lower than we are in the market. And yet they don't face regulations. They don't face the regulations we do. They don't face the regulation. They're not regulated. Their costs are lower. That's a great deal if you run a cable company, but it's awful for competitors, competition, and consumers. I think it also shows you why AT&T, the world's largest cable monopoly, is working so hard to block legislation that would remove their advantage and allow real competition for broadband service. What can Washington do? Well, first, let's accept the facts about the telecommunications marketplace. There is no monopoly in local telephone service, regardless of what you read. 20 million customers are served by competitors. Anyone should be convinced that 20 million, there is a lot of competition. Second, we need a better understanding of telecom competition. Today, for example, 115 Americans have wireless phones. Wireless competitors have complete access to customers. When you think about it, wireless have complete access to customers, consumers. I'm sure some of you in this room have sent emails from your seats while I've been talking. I'd be surprised if you haven't. I hope that's no reflection on me. Actually, it's a reflection on how, it's a, it is a reflection on how accessible and pervasive the new wireless technology, data technology has become. You can sit in this room send and receive emails. 100 million people regularly use the internet worldwide, and that number will quintuple in the next five, in the next four years. People are now making calls over the internet, calls that travel on our networks and compete with our wireline services. Cable companies pass almost 100 million homes in this country, and the satellite companies are coming on strong too. That's why focusing only on access lines, which we've all heard so long, is out of date. It's a mistake that keeps us, like SBC, locked in an old paradigm, an old regulation, and old arguments. And there's a lot of other ways to do it. Third, with respect to broadband, we need to make decisions based on the entire market, not the differing technologies in the market. There is one broadband market. There are several competitors in it doing it many ways, as I just said, wireless, cable, satellite, investing in their own networks. And we believe that we should be treated equally. We believe that's only fair. The Internet Freedom and Broadband Deployment Act is a badly needed remedy. It will level the broadband playing field by lifting the red tape off of DSL. And it will not remove, it will not remove any protections that are in place today regarding telephone voice service. It doesn't remove anything related to voice service. We believe the bill is a win-win for consumers, and we urge and hope that Congress will pass the bill swiftly. There is a precedent of sorts for this approach. Several years ago, the wireless industry was getting started, and policymakers opted to keep a hands-off approach. They chose to let the emerging industry develop on its own and mature on its own. 
no regulatory burdens were added to the wireless industry no disincentives were created many competitors came into the business and invested in their own technologies and their own networks as a result the wireless industry in this country has flourished prices continue to fall in the wireless industry and innovation continues to proceed swiftly we can achieve those same results in broadband by supporting this bill policymakers can let the market work this will allow competitors to compete and will allow telephone companies to be in, to begin making up for the huge head start given to cable providers the industry has taken giant leaps since passage of the Telecom Act in 1996, but its work is not yet done. The administration, the new FCC, and the Congress have the opportunity to immediately produce more competition, more innovation, and more investment for American consumers. Together we can finish that job, and if we do, it will be a success story that we can all be proud of and that we can all agree on. Thank you for listening to me, and I'll be glad to take your questions. Thank you very much. Um, this is a question that someone asked. It's asked, uh, what areas of Internet access, dial-up, DSL, cable, wireless, will SBC be focusing on as it goes into the future? Nice handwriting. That's not, well, I got some one that's not quite as nice. <laughs> <laughs> what area of internet access, dial-up, DSL, cable, wireless will SBC focus on going forward? We are in the dial-up business at this point in time as an ISP and the DSL business. Clearly, we won't be in the cable business, and we will one of these days before too long be in the wireless uh, data business. Internet access, wireless. What kind of future do you see for network providers that use leased lines? Will they survive the Internet recession? I think so. There's, uh, there's been some concern, and you know the stock market is down, and a lot of companies' uh, uh, market capital has been greatly reduced. But I believe there are uh, many companies will survive. There's a lot of niche markets. And so I guess the short answer to that is yes, there will be a lot of companies continue to provide that service and do quite well. What do you think can be done to provide DSL to smaller rural communities profitably? Well, that's a good question. We can provide DSL to rural communities and we'll do that. We may employ different technologies. In fact, we're doing some now uh, via a lease satellite arrangement, but DSL certainly that type of broadband service can be uh, put out in the rural areas of America and it will be. Some of that is already happening. We are doing some of that in Texas and other locations, but we're at the infancy of all this and broadband is ahead of us and I believe that uh, rural will be provided just like uh, urban communities will. This questioner notes that the economy is slowing down and the telecommunications industry is getting hit by that. Um, SBC share price is down about 9% and they ask, when do you expect to see a turnaround? I'd like to meet the person that asked that because 9% is not near enough. We were at a high of 59 and now we're in the low 40s, so we're down much more than 9% as is the whole industry. Certainly the economy has made a big difference to us and we saw that hit us uh, very hard in January. Uh, the economy, we see that in lower access lines and people being reluctant to keep additional lines. So you see it across the board and we're pretty good economic indicators. Uh, when will that turn around? That's a hard one to say. I see we reduced interest rates again tomorrow. Some people have a lot of interest in that. We have not yet seen an upturn. Uh, the April results don't indicate any upturn. The volumes continue to be low for us. Having said that, we're doing quite well as a company and we're going to be a little better than last year. I think some others have reported that. So I'm not negative on this at all. I believe we're just uh, 
have to wait and see, and hopefully the recovery will come uh, sooner rather than later. But certainly you can see the impacts of the economy, and we're all hopeful. Um, has wireless service like that offered by Singular a viable competition to residential uh, wireline local service? And if yes, what other wire, wireless carriers, uh, or should other wireless carriers be subsidized through the Universal Service Fund? Well, I'll answer the second part of that first. No, they should not be subsidized because we've made a, a conscious decision in this country not to regulate the wireless business, and it has caused a, a, a number of companies to be very successful. We have a number of competitors. The cost per minute has come way down and it really is the model for American business. Is wireless a competitor? You bet. It is a competitor for wireline service, and a great deal of that is happening now. Some almost exclusively in other parts of the world, telephone service is provided by a wireless uh, mechanism. Here it's certainly true. You find it mostly in the larger cities, but it is true. It is a viable alternative to wire telephone service, if you would, and that's another c competitor. That's something that's changed in all this marketplace. It's not SBC Monopoly or Verizon or anybody like that anymore. The whole marketplace has changed, and wireless is a very, uh, uh, it is a bona fide competitor to wire. This questioner, uh, perhaps think seeing something in the future, wants to know what plans you have regarding an IPO for Singular. When the market improves, <laughs> you don't do an IPO when the market's down. We're in the enviable position of not having to do that. And you do an IPO, of course, to uh, sell part of your stock to the public and to get funds to finance your capital programs and to build your networks, et cetera. And we have plans to do that. Uh, we were going to do it earlier rather than later. And had the economy not changed, uh, there was a good chance we would have already done it, but it did. And so we have that project on hold for the future. And when market conditions improve, uh, we're like a lot of other businesses, then we'll relook at that IPO and probably go forward with it. You talked a lot, of course, about the broadband fight that's going on and, and the efforts to provide consumers with it. But for the average American, for the consumers who are out there watching this, uh, this today, what is that really at stake for them? What do they stand to benefit? Well, I think it's important that consumers have access to more than one source of broadband because broadband really is the wave of the future. And all of you, I, I think, know what broadband means, but it means the ability to move more information to your residence or business. That's all we're talking about. I think it's important because it's, it's high-speed Internet access today and a few other things, but it's mostly high-speed Internet access. But it has great future for this country, I believe, in, in terms of environmental, uh, not driving uh, to work. It has huge connotations to have broadband. And I believe we're all well served by having more than one competitor because there is a huge future in this broadband for this country. And it's good. It gives us all access to more information, not, it, not that any of us want any more. We may have more than we can handle now. And that's something else to talk about. But nevertheless, it has huge positive implications for the country in the way we do things. And you can let your mind wander. It's, it's environmental. It's time. It's, it's a lot of different things. It's important to have more than one company be able to provide that obvious for lower choice or different services you might have. And we should be encouraging everybody in the marketplace to play by the same rules and provide uh, broadband service. I think competition would be very good. Uh, <clears throat> when do you expect uh, to have approval on all the states to sell long distance service? The, ni the 1996 Act uh, gave us a pathway to get in the long distance business. And had you asked me in 1996, I said we would have been there in 1998 or 9. Obviously, I don't know what I'm talking about <laughs> because it's 2001 and I'm in in four states. Not very good track record. It's been a very difficult process. I'm hopeful we'll be in the long distance business in all the states where SBC operates 
uh, by the end of next year. Hopefully sooner than that, but realism sets in. This questioner asks that if incumbents already are being allowed in the long distance business by meeting requirements in the 96 Telecommunications Act, why should Congress pass legislation that basically uh, changes that, uh, repeals that? Well, that's a good question on the surface, but if you stop and think about it, broadband didn't exist in 1996. It was intended to cover only voice type services. The internet was fledgling in 1996 and things have changed technologically quick. The internet is a big deal now. It wasn't here in 1996. It was intended to talk about voice, voice long distance, let us in the long distance voice business by meeting the requirements of the law. 2001 broadband is a whole different type service. We're not talking voice, we're talking about bits going down. It's a different deal today. Technology has changed. The competitors are trying to keep us out of the broadband business, but the broadband business was not addressed by the 1996 Act. I don't even think the word Internet's used in there. Maybe it is in one place, because we didn't know what it was. But now we're talking about broadband and the things, and our competitors certainly want to keep us out, and you can't blame them for that. On the other hand, it's a new service, it's a new access to customers and consumers and businesses, and there should be more competition in that. It should be unregulated. We should all go after it. You get a better deal. America gets a better deal. This question wants to know if, if, if you think we will continue to see mergers in the telecommunications industry. That's one I should say no comment to, but I'll comment <laughs> anyway. I think the general wisdom is, and this is not from Ed Whitaker, but I think the general wisdom is there will continue to be some consolidations in the telecom industry as we go forward. And I think that's a natural evolution uh, that there will be consolidations for efficiency reasons and scope and scale reasons. So I think most people would tell you that there, there will be some more. I get asked frequently, who are you going to buy next or who are you going to merge with, that sort of thing. We're not thinking about that right now. We have our head down on executing. It's a tough time in the business with the economy like it is, and our company, like a lot of others, faces some interesting challenges. And so those kind of things are on hold for a while, and we're not even thinking about it. Um, a couple of questions here that deal with uh, AT&T. One asks, why does AT&T avoid the local residential market? And another one notes that ATT is breaking up. Have you thought about buying it? Didn't you do that a few years ago, sort of uh, uh, have a merger with at and I have no comment on the, the second part there. Uh, that's old history. That's, true. that's uh, old stuff. As I said in my talk, and maybe not well enough, is nobody wants to serve the residential consumer because there's no money there. It's $10 a month in most of our states, and it costs us $30 to provide it. Nobody wants to go after it. We had the residential rates low in this country, very low in this country, and a good policy at the time so that everybody could have a telephone. And we made up the difference by charging higher rates for business. It was pretty good policy because everybody got a phone that way. But those are times past. Nobody will go in a business where they lose money. You wouldn't. I can't say I wouldn't because I'm in one. <laughs> But you wouldn't willingly do that. If I were a competitor, you wouldn't go after residential service. It's 10 bucks a month. You can't make any money. They go after the business customers whose rates are set high. That's why they're not in the residential business. I guess this question is the two of them. They ask uh, basically the same. When do you plan to file your next long distance application? And what are your plans for filing long distance application? Sounds like the same. Sounds just <laughs> close. We have to file applications to be in the long distance business first with, first with the state, com, uh, state regulators or state public utility commissions and pass a series of tests and then it's forwarded to the FCC. Our next one will be, I guess, in California and we hope to do that this summer sometime and it will come to the FCC and they have 90 days to act on our application. It's a very complicated procedure uh, I don't think it was intended that way, but that's the way it turned out, and so it takes tens of thousands of pages in a filing. It takes a semi-truck to move it up here. 
but our next one will be in uh, in California and we will be filing all our other states as quickly as we can uh, with the Ameritech states uh, coming next. You just mentioned California and so did a couple of our questioners. They want to know what, uh, what impact the energy crisis might have on your cus company's customers in California. Will bills go up due to the, uh, the rise of the shortage of energy out there? And uh, what what's, do you think can be done about that? Well, as you might guess, dial tone works on electricity. It's uh, closely connected to that. And as the energy costs go up, our costs would go up. Uh, we also have a lot of trucks out there using gasoline, et cetera. Uh, will it impact our consumers out there? I don't think so. I don't think we'll be raising our uh, bills in California to the California customers. Uh, we will just have to see if we can manage that within our own business to keep the rates down, but we're not anticipating raising any rates. But as you can expect, uh, we use a lot of electricity in my business, and hopefully we can manage that and not have to do anything else. Here's a questioner who notes that, uh, asks, why did you raise prices for DSL when costs for other telecom services are going down? And then they mention, what happened to Project Pronto? Okay. Project Pronto is the $6 billion that I talked about to build broadband to 80% of our customers. And we're well along in that and we'll finish uh, next year. But we have about 60% of our customers covered now with broadband and DSL. We raised prices in DSL because we were losing a lot of money. And we still are. But we have to cover our cost, and as I told you, we've been slowed down uh, by the regulators, and we had to create a separate subsidiary. And that costs a lot of money to create separate subsidiaries because you have to have your own computer systems, you have to have your own network, you have to hire your own people, you have to have your own HR programs, you have to have your own procurement sources, and it goes on and on and on. So it adds additional cost to us. Having said that, we raised it $10 a month. We did that early this year. Uh, the others followed us up, as you, as you would expect them to. But it's strictly, it's a new service. We have around a million customers. That price will come back down in the future, and it won't be the distant future. But we've got to get the regulations uh, pretty clear on all this to see what our mandate is and how we can go forward. In the meantime, we're trying to make this an economic business thing. Commissioner, would like a couple of comments from you. One, would you comment on last week's request by the Justice Department that the FCC look into prices you charge for unbundled network elements in Missouri? And secondly, a comment on a bill introduced in the Michigan State Legislature that would uh, separate your wholesale and retail operations? Well, I'll be happy to. <laughs> I think if you look at the energy situation in California, and the deregulation, you should have your answer on splitting the telephone company because it's a disaster. It would be an absolute disaster to force us to split up because you get no economies of scale, you get no efficiencies, and you create just a lot of chaos. I think that would be a disaster. And I think you have to look no further than what California did in deregulation because it's the exact same model. The second question was... Uh, the uh, Justice, Department. Justice Department. As part of our filings for long distance, we make cost studies. And a cost study is what does it cost you to provide something? Well, as you can guess, in Texas it might cost less or more than it does to provide the same service in Missouri. And into that goes a lot of things like uh, wage rates, labor rates, taxes, et cetera, et cetera. And so the costs are different in different places. The Justice Department has wanted to know why in Missouri it's going to cost us a little bit more than it does in some of our other states. We make detailed cost studies, and it is what it is on the face. You factor in all those things like labor rates, cost of equipment, property taxes, et cetera, and you come up with a number. So it's fine if they look. That's great, and we'll be able to show that uh, this is our cost of providing the service, and that's hopefully where the rates will be set. Just like any other business, some things cost more than others in different locations. This questioner wonders if uh, phone calls might eventually be transmitted by data instead of voice. 
And if so, how much control will companies like SBC have if they are given easier access to high-speed data transmission? Well, that's an interesting question. We'll have to see where technology goes. Uh, voice over IP or Internet protocol is being done now in some locations. It will be done more. It doesn't affect SBC any differently. It's being done now. It doesn't give SBC any more control. Voice over IP is a, a technological innovation that you will probably see on a wide scale in the next uh, two to three, four years. I can't call that exactly. It's being done now in some selected locations at PBXs and things like that. But it doesn't impact SBC, nor what we're talking about. We're talking here about a marketplace that a lot of people have access to, cable companies, wireless companies, satellite companies, et cetera. It's not like we have a monopoly anymore. We do not. I have 20 million fewer customers than I had uh, just a, a few short months ago, it seems like. So there is competition out there. Don't care what you read, I have 20 million fewer customers. It's a big deal. It's all wide open. And so it has no impact, really. Here's a couple questions along the same line. This questioner asks, should the FCC be able to find companies millions of dollars for blocking competition, as the FCC Chairman Michael Powell wants? The second question, which may show a certain uh, attitude here, it says, how high should the fine be to get bell companies to stop acting in an anti-competitive manner? I bet that was submitted by a competitor. <laughs> Let me tell you about these things you read about uh, fining people, etc. They're not fines, they're penalties. As a condition to get in the long distance business, we have to agree to certain conditions. One of those conditions is penalties, and that is if you don't do a certain thing in a certain time for one of your competitors, you pay a fine, a penalty, automatically, not a fine, a penalty. These are agreed to up front. You miss one, you pay. We also had to agree to some penalties with the FCC as a result of our merger with Ameritech. So these are all detailed as penalties, and if you don't do certain things, then you pay a penalty. Would you guess that we have a lot of those criteria or performance measures to meet every month? How many would you guess? Would you say we have to meet 100 of those or pay a penalty? Not fines, but penalties. We have to make, at SBC, we have 3 million performance measures a month. 3 million. 3 times 10 to the 6th for an engineer. It's a big number. If we have 99.999 good service providing all this to our competitors and we miss one, we pay. Nobody, nobody can make three million a month perfectly. You as a, as a commonsensical person or a business person or whatever would say, if it's 20 measures, that's one thing. If it's three million, that's something else. You can make 99.999% of the measures and still pay because it's, it's humanly impossible to make 3 million measures a month. Just can't be done. Don't care how good you are or who you are. We are measured on 3 million items a month, slightly over that. 3 million a month. That's what we think is too much regulation. And I think you would agree. 3 million is, a, is an absurd number. That's what we measure every month. That's 36 million a year, and it's going up. The fining authority or penalties don't bother us in the least in terms of if the FCC wants to make them bigger, but make it manageable. Give us 20 or 30. Give us something that can be done. Don't make us do 3 million a month because nobody can do that. You can't make 3 million. How would you like to try to make 3 million a month? 13 states. 500 competitors and so forth. Every one of them measured every day on everything you do, it can't be done. So the authority to levy bigger penalties doesn't bother us. Just give us something that's manageable. Three million is impossible. Um, before I ask the last question, I have a couple of uh, business, a uh, little bit of business to do up here. One is to present you with a certificate of appreciation for your appearance here today at the National Press Club. Thank you, Greg. And secondly is a uh, National Press Club mug that you can put on your desk and do with it Thank whatever you. you will.
As a, a, as a last question, um, this question notes that just a few years ago, a typical family had to remember one telephone number. Today, my family of four has five phone numbers, and this individual has said he has four at his office. How close are we to memory meltdown? I sure like that person if he's got five numbers and two more at work. That's, uh, the, that, that's what I'm in, that business. We, are, uh, we have to think about that. We have to think about all this information, and we do some thinking about that, too. And you can't have your whole life absorbed in that, and it obvi has, obviously has to be prioritized. There are some ways to make it less hassle or simpler. Uh, we're going to have to figure out how to deal with the huge amounts of information and decide what's important and what's not important. There are days I feel like I'm, I have been through the meltdown, and I'm sure you feel the same way. I don't have the answers to that. I know we can't lose personal contact with each other either. We have to have that, so we just have to figure that out. But there are good things coming down that will help us do that. And get away from this memory meltdown, deal better with information. Thanks for having me. It's nice to see all of you. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. I'd also like to thank National Press Club staff members Melinda Cook, Pat Nelson, Joanne Booz, Melanie Abdel-Dermott, and Howard Rothman for organizing today's luncheon. Also, thanks to the NPC Library for the research, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming here today. Thank you. <coughs> but Pacific Telesis, Mr. Whitaker promised the Communications Workers of America there would be no layoffs following the acquisition. He held true to his word, and he became the first executive in 40 years to be invited to the union's annual convention. Mr. Whitaker was born 59 years ago in Ennis, Texas a town of about 12,000 located south of Dallas. And he appears to have maintained his small town tastes and values. He has told friends that he prefers a bologna sandwich to fancy French food. He continues to maintain a 1,200-acre ranch about 80 miles north of San Antonio, where he clears his own brush and builds ponds. Mr. Whitaker earned his bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from Texas Tech University in 1964. He worked his way through a variety of posts at Southwestern Bell and SBC, becoming the chief executive in 1990. Under his leadership, SBC has been named the most admired telecommunications company in America by Fortune Magazine for four successive years. SBC also is regularly cited for the diversification of its workforce. The company has been named as one of the 10 best places for minorities to work and America's top company for women and minority business owners to do business with. Mr. Whitaker has an easygoing management style, but don't be fooled by that, his friends say. He looks like he just got off his horse, a John Wayne type who's easygoing and slow talking, said one friend, but you wouldn't want to get into a fight with him. <laughs> he started as a lineman for Southwestern Bell back during his college days in Texas. Today, as chairman, and Chief Operating Officer, Chief Executive Officer of Southwestern's successor company, SBC Communications, Inc. Under Mr. Whitaker's guidance, SBC grew from the smallest of the seven baby bells created by the breakup of AT&T in 1984 to become the second largest local telephone company in the United States. Last year, SBC's revenues exceeded $51 billion. The company has grown mostly by acquisition. Mr. Whitaker has purchased Pacific Telesis, Southern New England Telephone, and most recently, Ameritech. Today, SBC provides telephone services to one-third of the nation. It is the dominant provider in 13 states, including California, Texas, Illinois, and Michigan. It is also part owner of Singular, the nation's second largest wireless telephone company. It also has become the second largest internet access provider in the nation. Mr. Whitaker has made no secret of his intention to build SBC into one of the top four global telecommunications firms. Though the stock market retreat has cooled the pace of growth for now, 
Mr. Whitaker is known both for his coolness and boldness in doing deals. On the verge of closing a mega merger in 1998, he calmly chaperoned his daughter at her wedding, giving no hint that on the following day he would bet the company on the $62 billion acquisition of Ameritech. When SBC Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Richard Ryan, and I am Senior Washington Correspondent for the Detroit News and President of the National Press Club. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, and those of you who are watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio. The video archive of today's luncheon is provided by Connect Live and is available through the National Press Club website at press. Org. National Press Club luncheons are also carried live by many sites on the World Wide Web. Press Club members may also access transcripts of our luncheons at our website. Non-members may purchase transcripts, audio and videotapes by calling 1-888-343-1940. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of, of some upcoming speakers. On Monday, May 21st, Stephanie Powers, actress and president of the William Holden Wildlife Foundation, will discuss efforts to conserve endangered wildlife species that are now threatened by illegal commercial hunting. And on Wednesday, May 23rd, Joseph Leonard, chairman and president and CEO of AirTran Airways, will be our guest. His topic, Fasten Your Seatbelts, a view of the airline business from a low, carrier, low fare carrier perspective. And on Thursday, May 24th, George D. Warrington, President and CEO of Amtrak, will be here to discuss. Now he's in a fight, a battle over the future of the broadband market. And he's here today to tell us about that fight. So please welcome to the National Press Club, a man who has been described as John Wayne in a business suit, Ed Whitaker, Chairman of SBC Communications. Thank you very much, Dick. I've been called a lot of things this morning. I've never been called. <laughs> Anomaly, a John Wayne in a business suit. I'm none of that, but anyway, it was a very nice introduction. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today at this prestigious forum and to be able to talk to you about my business. The National Press Club has hosted some of the most influential speakers of our time, and I thank you for inviting me. Bill informed me that this is a good crowd, but Miss America was bigger. So I know my position. It's especially good to be here now that Washington has a uh, renewed appreciation for Texans. You know, I used to get kidded a lot about my Texas accent when I would come to Washington. But I've seen more boots and heard more howdies on this visit than I did all month in San Antonio, just for your information. As I begin today, I would like to offer my best wishes to President Bush as he tackles the tough issues facing America. I believe he will do very well, but in all honesty, I think he stumbled on a major... ...his proposals to solve the national transportation crisis. If you have any questions for our speaker, and I trust that you will, Please write them at, on the cards that are provided at your table and pass them up to me. But please make sure to write legibly because I can't ask them if I can't read them. Uh, I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. Please hold your applause until all head table guests are introduced. From your right and my left, Tony Pugh, national correspondent for Knight Ritter. Adriel Bettelheim, reporter, Congressional Quarterly. Amy Fickling, Managing Editor, Telecom Reports. Gary Martin, Washington Bureau Chief, San Antonio Express News. Kim Wallace, Senior Vice President, Lehman Brothers. Gil Klein, Media General News, News Service and a former president of the National Press Club. And skipping over our speaker for a moment, Bill Roberts, Bloomberg News and the Press Club member who organized today's luncheon. Thank you, Bill. Manuel Mirabel, Chair, the National Hispanic Leadership Coalition. Carol Bowers, 
Associate Editor, Kiplinger, Washington Editors. Takeshi Yamawaki, U.S. E Economics Correspondent, the Shahi Shimbun. <laughs> Our guest today, Ed Whitaker, is somewhat of an anomaly in today's business world. He has been with the same company for 38 years.